Okay, so um, my name is Edward Dorr. Most people call me Ed. Um, I'm a professor of physics at the University of Sheffield in the United Kingdom, and I've agreed to talk to you today about an, an aspect of gravitational wave detectors, which isn't actually usually discussed in detail in these kinds of talks. Um, and the reason is because, well, frankly, it's quite hard. But these are very important things, um, particularly for people in India who are students, perhaps postdocs, academics, and ordinary people, because, of, as you all know, India is planning, with Prime Minister Modi's approval, to build another LIGO detector. So it's a terribly exciting thing. Um, on the left, you see, of course, the famous, now famous, um, LIGO Hanford detector in uh, Washington State, um, in the United States. And on the right, you see some markers for the Hingodi site where the plan is to build the Indian detector. Now, um, of course, the detector is a, a large and impressive machine, as you can see from the picture of the Hanford site, and I'm sure you've all seen that before. Um, but I want to start with a sort of unexpected twist and not talk about LIGO for a few minutes. I want to talk about something else, which will seem disconnected from LIGO, but if you're patient and bear with me, you'll see where the connection is. So um, when I first went to LIGO to visit, I visited the Hanford site, and it was in 1998, which is 22 years ago now. Um, and when I looked out of the window of the airplane, I'm flying over there from, from Massachusetts, from MIT, which is where I was, was working as a postdoc at the time. You look out of the window and you see this. This picture on the left shows you what you see. And of course, you can see um, we're quite high up here, probably about 30,000 feet up, maybe 35,000. And you can, of course, see a road. But then, of course, the thing that you really can see is all of these very circular um, patches. And they're, of course, fields of crops because the um, American West, um, east of the Rocky Mountains, but in the West, and then also on the other side of the Rocky Mountains in, 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 in California, in those states, is covered in agricultural fields. And nowadays, the fields are quite often circular, or they form arcs of circles. Now, of course, when you first see this, it looks a bit strange, because I'm not used to seeing circular fields. I'm from England, where the fields were laid out during Anglo-Saxon times and haven't changed that much since. But if you look carefully at one of these fields, what you see is the reason they're that shape, and you might have guessed this, is because they're irrigated, they're, they're, they're watered. And this um, oval that I've made in yellow is, is circling the irrigation system. And you can see the water vapor rising off the irrigator. Um, and it's pretty impressive actually, because if you look at the length of this thing, it's about, well, just eyeballing it, it's about a kilometer long, actually. And um, it's delivering irrigation water. And the reason the field's circular is because the, the end furthest away from you in this picture is fixed. And the end nearest to you is rotating around. So of course, it, it traces out a circle. And that circle defines the field. So you've got a field with a kilometer radius irrigated by water. The thing that is interesting and the thing that connects this to LIGO eventually, it's a bit of a long road, is that this irrigation pipe is dead straight. It's as straight as the LIGO arms almost. And it moves around in a circle. Now, the LIGO arms don't have to do that, of course. They're fixed to the ground. But this thing moves. And it doesn't all move together. The bit in the middle doesn't move. And the bit at the outside edge moves around at a constant speed. How is this possible? How can that be? How can this machine exist? You certainly can't sit in the middle and twist the pipe. This can't be a rigid structure. You couldn't construct a kilometer long rigid structure containing water that you could twist at one end and have the whole thing move. So that is not the mechanism. Think of the stiffness and the torque that the thing would have to have if it was all actuated from the center like that, or for that matter, from any other point. So how can this be? How can this machine exist? Well, the answer is it exists because of feedback control. So I'd like you to take away a message that feedback control makes almost impossible machines possible. In fact, almost all machines in the world are possible because of control systems and feedback. And the LIGO interferometers are no exception. And many of you will know this. I don't know what level of torque 
I'm supposed to be giving here. I don't know whether you are all already experts on all the LIGO technology or whether you're all newcomers or whether there's a distribution between those things. So I've had to try and guess at a level that everybody will find interesting. So I hope that's, I hope I succeed in that. So what this system consists of is sections, each of which consists of a stiff girder with motor driven wheels on one end and a hinge that connects it to the next section. And when you put together a bunch of these sections in this photograph, you can see them going into the distance, you get a very long water pipe and there are sprinklers that hang off it and actually do the watering. Now, here's the clever bit. The hinges incorporate a thing called a linkage, which is basically a bar which connects the two sections on either side of the hinge. And I've drawn a di diagram of it at the bottom. If the hinge bends away from straight, if it bends away from an angle of 180 degrees with respect to the next section along, then a contact connects. And that contact supplies power to the motor. And the motor then pushes this end next to the hinge forward until the joint is straight again. It's a very, very simple um, switch, power supply, and a motor. And each linkage section has that little machine on it. Now, when you connect these linkages together in series and you connect the outermost wheel so it's always moving and the innermost section fixed at the other end to a fixed point, you know, a stake driven into the ground or a concrete foundation or something. And what happens is the outermost wheel starts running because it's running all the time. The hinge that's next along becomes bent. That activates the switch, which turns the motor on. And then that wheel starts running. Now, after a while, of course, the next hinge along in the sequence becomes bent and its motor starts running. So the outer wheel is always running. And all the other wheels are switching on and off with the, um, with, with the outcome that all of the hinges should be as straight as possible at all times. So when you do this, what you end up with is an outer wheel always runs and inner wheels, which run less and less of the time as you get towards the middle, where there's no need for a wheel because it doesn't move at all. So this is an example of feedback control. It's a very simple type of control, and it's got a name in the business, a sort of colloquial slang name. People call them bang bang servos. And the reason they call them that is because when the motor switches on, it makes a bang. It's an abrupt switching on. And when it switches off, it makes another bang. I mean, it's not a real bang, it's an electrical bang, if you like. So if you plot the voltage across the motors as a function of time going from the outside edge to the inside edge, the motor on the outside is always on. The motor on the inside is always off, so there doesn't need to be a motor at all. The motor at R equals naught is always off. The motor halfway out from the center of the circle to the outside is on half the time. And the motors that are further than halfway out are on most of the time. And the motors that are closer to the center than halfway out are off most of the time. Now, um, this kind of server mechanism is actually very common because the easiest thing to do with power is to just switch it on and off. So there are many, many examples of these kinds of controls in the world. Um, other examples apart from this crop irrigator are heating and air conditioning systems where you have a temperature sensor and a switch that turns on a heater or a cooling unit, depending on whether you're air conditioning or heating, um, when the temperature exceeds or drops below some fixed point. Another example, which is maybe closer to what you're doing right now, is that the power supply that's supplying power to your computer is almost certainly what's called a switching power supply, which operates by creating the voltage that you need by continuously switching on and off the voltage from the wall using high power um, switching FET transistors usually. So those are two other examples. Now, if you're interested in these crop systems, it's a little bit of fun, but you might want to go and have a look at this website it shows you how they actually make them. And it's quite a nice video. It's quite a good example of lots of manufacturing techniques, welding techniques. It's kind of a fun thing to see. Now, the other thing to notice about this kind of thing is that although the sections of the irrigator are nominally similar to each other, they're not absolutely identical. If it turns out that one of the motors runs a little bit faster than all the rest, well, that doesn't matter 
because all that will happen is that motor will switch on for less time to compensate for the fact it's running faster. So that's another feature of control systems is they reduce sensitivity to the absolute engineering parameters of the parts of the machine. And that can be very important because often there are unavoidable variations between the parameters and properties of electrical parts when they're manufactured. Right, now bang bang servos are not great. The problem is exactly the bang and the bang, right? They tend to be noisy because every time you have a switching um, or on and off of the parts of the system, it generates a transient and that transient takes the form of electrical noise. Now it doesn't matter when you're in the middle of a farmer's field because nobody cares about electrical noise there. But when you're sitting next to LIGO, you don't want constant electrical switching noise. In fact, in the initial LIGO detectors, there were lots of switching power supplies, very similar to the ones that power your computers all over the experiment. And we discovered the hard way that these power supplies generated an un unacceptable electrical noise. And in advanced LIGO, we replaced the switching power supplies at great expense with old fashioned so-called linear power supplies, which use transformers because they're less electrically noisy. And that actually improved the noise level at the site quite a lot. So we don't use um, bang bang servos very much on LIGO, although they, they are used, believe me, in places. Um, we use linear servos. Now in a linear servo, a linear control system, what you've got instead of a, abrupt switching is that you've got a parameter which can be adjusted in proportion to a sensor signal. And the sensor signal can take a continuous range of values. So that sensor signal is generally called the error signal. And in general, the servo acts to send the error signal or set the error signal to zero. And it does so by adjusting another signal, which is called the control signal. All right, so the, the, the servo's job is to force the error signal to go to zero or as close to it as it can by using a control signal to make a change to the system. Now you don't do a perfect job. It turns out the error signal will not be exactly zero. It'll be within a small error margin about zero. And that's tend to, you know, hopefully for a good design, that's a small number. So feedback control is used in LIGO to stabilize many different things, to make the interferometer behave itself so that it can operate as a gravitational wave detector. It's used to stabilize the length of the arms, the distances between the mirrors. It's used to stabilize the frequency of the laser so that the wavelength of the laser light is resonant with the distances between the suspended mirrors so that power can build up. And it's used to stabilize the alignment of the mirrors so that the light from the lasers bounces back and forth between the ends of the arms and doesn't get lost by scattering off into the beam tube. Now you can imagine that the control systems that are used on LIGO to achieve all of that control of all of those different aspects of the machine are very complicated. And that's why people don't talk about this subject much um, in these kinds of talks, but I'm sort of trying to be brave and doing it anyway. So before diving into controls on LIGO, I want to go and do another example, which is an example from electronics. And it's a very simple electronic component, which is controlled by a linear servo not so dissimilar from the servos that control LIGO in some ways. So some of you will have heard of components called operational amplifiers. They're ubiquitous. They're very, very common in um, analog circuits. They're components of things like filters, um, amplifiers that do all kinds of jobs in the world. And this is a picture of one. Um, it's called an OP27. That's a very common low noise operational amplifier. Um, analog devices make them, Texas Instruments make them, loads of people make them. And I'm going to explain to you how an operational amplifier works by starting with its properties. Now, properties are very simple. It's got power supply at both plus a supply voltage and minus a supply voltage. So this could be, for example, plus five and minus five volts. And it's got two inputs and one output. And very simply, the output voltage is again multiplied by the difference between the voltages on the two inputs. So V out equals G times V plus minus V minus, the difference between these two voltages. That's the first property. Now, the second property is that the current load from the amplifier, the current drawn, the current going into the operational amplifier or out from it on both of the inputs is very, very tiny. 
those currents can essentially be regarded as zero. So it doesn't draw any current. It draws such small currents that it doesn't matter. The other property, which is important, is that the multiplicative factor, the G that multiplies the difference between the inputs to give the output, that G is a very large number of order 100,000. The only thing is that if you make 20 of these devices and try and make that, them identical, you'll find that between the devices, there's a large variation in the actual value of G. In one amplifier, it might be 100,000. In the next one, it might be 300,000. So you don't have control of the, over the exact value of G. So if you plot the output of this amplifier as a function of the difference between the two inputs, you get the blue line. So what happens is when I've given an example here where G is 10 to the 5 and the voltage supplies plus or minus 5 volts. So when the voltage difference at the input is within 50 microvolts of zero, the output is proportional to the input. So you get linearity. But above that, you reach the supply rails, and then the output saturates. So if you take a step back from this and look at it, it looks extremely nonlinear. If I have a signal which is oscillating back and forth like my mouse pointer, the output is going to be going to plus and minus the supply rails. It's going to spend most of its time at either plus 5 volts or minus 5 volts. It's hardly going to be in the linear regime at all. So you might say to yourself, I'm not going to use this thing as an amplifier because it's useless because any input above 50 microvolts is not going to produce a linear response. Why are these things called amplifiers? Well, the answer is because they are invariably used with a feedback circuit. And let me show you how that works. What you do is you connect the plus input to zero volts. And the minus input, you connect to your voltage input through a resistor. And then, and this is the important bit, you have a wire going through another resistor that connects the output to the input. Now let's analyze how this circuit's gonna behave. And it's just a little bit of mathematics. So the first thing is that we've already know, we've already learned that the output voltage is the gain times the difference between the two inputs. But the plus input is at zero volts, we've grounded it. So actually in this case, the output voltage is just minus G times the negative input voltage. Now that's the first equation. And the next equation you can derive using Ohm's law. I hope you've all met Ohm's law. So if you start at V in and you have a current which goes this away, that current can't go into the op amp because remember the other property of op amps is they don't draw current. So any current that goes through this resistor has to go around the outside through the feedback resistor, sorry, and it has to go into the output of the op amp. It's the only place it can go because this output isn't drawing any current either because it's just a measured voltage. So if we have the same current through both these resistors, we can write some more equations. We can write that V minus is V in minus the voltage drop across the RA, which is just I times RA. So that's another equation. And then we can write similarly that V out is V minus minus the voltage drop across the feedback resistor. So V out is V minus minus I times RF. Now equations two and three both contain the current I. So you can rearrange the equations to express I in terms of the other parameters and then set them equal to each other. So that's what I've done here. I'm circling with my mouse. So we discover that we get this relationship between V in V out, V minus, and the two resistors. But we haven't yet used equation one. So equation one says that V minus equals minus V out over G. So if I replace both the instances of V minus in this equation with minus V out over G, I get this kind of complicated looking equation at the bottom. Not that complicated, but it's a little bit complicated. However, it's not as complicated as it looks. Because don't forget that the gain G is 100,000. It's an enormous number. So looking at this equation, there's two terms that contain 1 over G. But those terms are a factor of 10 to the 5 smaller than the other two terms because G is large. So if I cross those two terms out because they're insignificant and then rearrange the two terms I've got left, then I get the ratio of V out to V in.
which is the voltage gain of the circuit, or sometimes it's called the transfer function of the circuit. And it's very simple. It's minus the feedback resistance divided by the input resistance. Notice that the voltage gain of this circuit doesn't depend on G at all. Now, that's really interesting because I told you at the beginning of this discussion that G was not very well determined by the manufacturing process. It could vary by a factor of two or three or even five. But that doesn't matter because when you use an op-amp in a feedback circuit, the parameter G doesn't actually define the important properties of the circuit. It just enables the feedback to work properly. Another way of thinking about the circuit is to write it like this. So we've got V in, and then we've got two resistors, and then we've got V out at the bottom. So this forms a potential divider. And then we can measure the voltage in the middle between the two resistors, and that's V minus. And the way to think about it is that V out adjusts itself so that for a given V in, V minus is zero volts. So that means when V in is positive, V out has to be negative. So in this circuit, it's called an inverting circuit. If you have a sine wave going in that starts by going positive, the output will start by going negative. There's a minus sign in the game, but that's OK. So that's how an op amp in negative feedback mode works. And some of you have seen that whole thing. and Maybe you've all seen it. I have no idea. But it's, the reason it's interesting is because just like the crop irrigator, you have a situation where a component that looks as if it's going to be very badly behaved, except over a very small range of signals, actually can be stabilized to behave very well using a control system. Right, so that's um, the next example. Now we're on to this example. <laughs> Finally, after I don't know, 23 minutes, we're on to LIGO. So you've all seen this picture before. You've got a four kilometer interferometer, laser beams fired down four kilometer tubes, bouncing off mirrors suspended from wires at either end of the two arms. You've got quite complicated situation because all those mirrors have to be freely suspended. And so they're going to try and misbehave. So this system is certainly going to need some control, isn't it? All right, so we're going to talk about that control a little bit today, but I'm not going to go into huge amounts of detail because if I do, it'll be a very boring talk and a lot of you will get lost. So why do you need servo controls in LIGO? Well, here's the thing. LIGO has to have an enormous gain, rather like the op operational amplifier, because it has to be able to amplify signals where the mirror motions are less than an atometer, less than 10 to the minus 18 meters. So in order for those signals to be detected, the, the, the machine has to be linear, but it has to have a large enough gain that you can detect these tiny motions. So that means that the interferometer is going to try and saturate the signals which are much larger than 10 to the minus 18 meters. So in order to stop it saturating, you're going to have to control it. OK. And of course, there are much larger signals trying to move those mirrors. The most important one is seismic noise. But there's also another source of noise called gravity gradient noise. And that's where the local gravitational field in the vicinity of your mirrors is undergoing fluctuations because of anthropogenic environment. And that's another source of environmental noise that affects LIGO. Here's another thing you need to control, the laser. The laser frequency must always be such that the wavelength the laser is putting out is matching the resonances between the mirrors in the arm cavities and also matching the common mode length of the whole interferometer. So I'll show you the optical configuration in a minute, though I expect you've seen it in one of the previous talks. But Perhaps one of the previous talks will have talked about power building up in the interferometer. Well, that's only going to be possible if the laser has the correct wavelength to drive the gaps between the mirrors into resonance. And that doesn't happen for free. It happens because of control. So all of these things, the motions of the mirrors, which are going to be affected by seismic noise, that seismic noise is going to have to be nulled out to the, so that you can see the gravitational wave signal so that you can keep the detector in the linear regime. So it acts as a gravitational wave detector and not just a glorified pendulum, right? And finally, the optics, the laser light itself has to be under control so that the optical state of the interferometer is linear as well. So here's a picture, another one you will have seen before. Okay, so this is the advanced LIGO 
optical configuration. And I'll just walk you through some of the elements um, because maybe you've forgotten them since last time you heard a talk on this stuff. Over here on the left, we've got the master laser. Then we have an optical modulator, which introduces modulation sidebands onto the laser light. We're not going to talk too much about modulation today. You might just want to note that the modulation frequency is, well, there's two of them, actually, 9 megahertz and 45 megahertz. That's a much lower frequency than the frequency of the laser carrier, which is about 10 to the 14 hertz, right? So this is adding a very slow phase modulation to the laser carrier. Then you've got this mode cleaner. What that does is it makes the spatial shape of the laser beam a two-dimensional Gaussian. It gets rid of all the higher order mode content, or at least attenuates the higher order mode content. And it does that using a very high finesse resonant cavity. So of course the laser light has to be resonant with the length of this cavity. And then you have, so out of this system, you get about 22 watts of laser light. Now, then you go into the interferometer itself. So there's this power recycling mirror. That defines one end of this Michelson interferometer. It's a power recycled Michelson interferometer. So light bounces back and forth between this mirror and the super mirror that is effectively the rest of the machine. If you look into this mirror, it looks just like another mirror, even though it's sending half its light down the X arm and half its light down the Y arm. If you look into it, it looks just like another mirror. So this is another cavity. So you get buildup of power in that cavity. So you get about 800 watts here. And then the interferometer arms contain two more resonators. Now, these resonators are really long. These are really the gravitational wave detectors, these two resonators. And there's four kilometers between these mirrors. So in these arms, you get further power buildup, stepping up from 800 watts to about 100 kilowatts. There's an awful lot of power in these arms. Now, these all these test masses, which you see labeled, including the power recycling mirror and the mirrors of the mode cleaner, all of those are suspended from wires. And then there's this complicated bit at the output called signal recycling, which I'm not going to talk about much today. It allows you to tune the frequency response of LIGO. That's all I'm going to say. So all of these mirrors are suspended from wires. They're all free, nominally free, to move in many degrees of freedom. They can move parallel to the beam. They can tilt either in the horizontal plane or the vertical plane, that's called pitch and yaw. So they can pitch, they can yaw. And every time they do something like that, usually driven by seismic noise, they try and move the interferometer away from the state, which you need it to stay in for it to be an effective gravitational wave detector. So we have to control this machine, which means we have to determine its state by making some measurements. We then have to define some error signals, which we are going to try and set to zero. And in setting those error signals to zero, we have to drive the mirrors. We have to move them around to preserve them in the state where the error signals are close to zero, which by carefully designing our feedback system, that state will be the state where the machine is sensitive to gravitational waves. So I'm going to superpose on this now a sketch of the length control system. This, by the way, is just controlling the distances between the mirrors. It's not even talking about the alignment of the mirrors. That's a whole other control system, which I'm not going to have a chance to talk about today. Okay. So here's my control system. And you can see it's a kind of a complicated one. The, unlike the operational amplifier, where there was a single error signal, which was V minus, and a single control signal, which is V out, in the case of LIGO, there are many error signals and many control signals. So the control system for length is what is called a MIMO control system. MIMO stands for multi-input, multi-output. So just to run you through it, all of the, what I, the, you'll see that there's some darker red lines appeared here. These show you places where the machine state is being sampled optically. So at the power recycling mirror, there is a way of measuring the power reflected off the back surface of that mirror. And so this red line represents the laser light going into this thing, which I'm circling with my mouse, which is a photodetector. So that's one sensor that you've got connected to your control system. The next one is the output of the interferometer itself. So the output of the interferometer is represented by these photodetectors here. And just for illustrative purposes, I've connected one of those photodetectors as the next input to my control system. And finally, there's a port called the pickoff port, 
which samples the power actually in the Michelson interferometer. So that's between the recycling mirror and the signal recycling mirror and the input test masses. So inside this little cross, the pickoff takes the power out of there and samples that on a photodetector as well. So the photodetectors take these three optical signals and convert them into three um, electrical signals. Now, these electrical signals are then mixed down to a much lower frequency. That's a technique called heterodyning. They're mixed down at the same frequencies at which the resonant sidebands were introduced into the laser light right at the beginning of the chain by this electro-optic modulator. So there's mixers that go at 9 megahertz and at 45 megahertz. Now, these signals coming out of these mixers are the inputs to your control system. So they're the things that are used to define the error signals, the things that you're trying to set to zero. The outputs to the control system are these purple or pink lines. And you'll see they're labeled by, by acronyms. So ETMX is the end test mass in the X arm. So that's this one that I'm circling now. ETMY is the end test mass in the Y arm. ITMX are the intermediate test masses or the inner test masses in the X and Y arms. So that's these two. I guess they're called input test masses. That's what I stands for. I have trouble with these acronyms as well. And then BS is the beam splitter. So you can move that too. RM is the recycling mirror. All of these six mirrors and another one, the, the second mirror in the mode cleaner. So there's actually seven mirrors which can be pushed on by the outputs, the controls of this control system. And what this control system actually does inside is actually quite complicated. And I don't suppose you find that all that surprising. But what it does is it connects these six inputs, measures those inputs, uses them to define some error signals. And then those error signals are used to control these seven outputs. I just heard a bing. I wonder what that means. OK, I'm just going to carry on, assuming it doesn't mean anything bad. Um, so let's have a look at what this actually looks like in the control room, because you can imagine that this control turns into some kind of thing that you have to worry about when you're operating LIGO. And of course, it does. So this is what it actually looks like. Now, this is a terribly complicated diagram. I was actually there when this was designed. Um, it was designed by Peter Fritschel and Nergis Mavovala for initial LIGO in probably about 1999. I remember them sitting together and putting together this screen at LIGO Hanford. Um, but it, it's not as complicated as it looks because you can see over on the left, there are lots of little black lines, one, two, three, four, five, six inputs. And then those six inputs go into this thing called an input matrix, which is basically a matrix of numbers that connects the six inputs to four outputs. And those four outputs, I've drawn this yellow box around the four sections of controls that do things with these outputs and all that's in these all that's in these boxes are filters which perform signal processing on the signals that are coming out of this matrix and based on the results of that filtering and we'll talk more about filtering in a minute those four outputs go into the outputs of those um, the outputs of those controls go into an output matrix which connects to these seven controlled mirrors so if you're in the control, you can open up this screen and have a look and see which of the filter sections are switched in. They're all in green. And which ones are switched out? They're all in red. And these four controlled, um, these four controlled domains, DARM stands for differential arm. That's the control degree of freedom corresponding to the difference between the arm lengths. MIC corresponds to the Michelson interferometer. PRC is the power recycling cavity. So that's the cavity between the recycling mirror and the interferometer. And CALM is the common mode arm length. That's the average length of the two arms. That's the thing that has to be resonant with the laser light. So those are your four control degrees of freedom. Right. And that's kind of a complicated thing. Multi-input, multi-output servo. And it's necessary to keep LIGO working. So I talked a minute ago about filters. Okay, So I want to talk a little bit more about filters. So back to a picture of the operational amplifier. I told you that the output does whatever it takes to keep the voltage V minus at zero. But what happens if the input voltage changes really quickly? What happens if it changes too fast for the op amp to react and to null out the signal? So this brings in the topic of the bandwidth of servos. Servos are not infinitely fast. They can't react 
to infinitely fast changes. And a useful way to think about this is that the servo mechanism has what's called a frequency response. At low frequencies, if you have a signal at the input that's changing slowly, the servo can react and respond. But at high frequencies, the servo perhaps cannot keep up with the input if the frequency is high enough. So somewhere between low frequencies and high frequencies, there's a crossover between those two regimes. And that crossover is called the unity gain frequency of the servo. So above that unity gain frequency, the servo actually fails. It can't control the machine. And below that unity gain frequency, the servo works. So I'll give you an example of a frequency response. Now, this hasn't anything to do with servos. This is just a off the wall sort of pure, pure example slide just to give you a, get you thinking about frequency responses. Suppose you have a mass on a string connected to a support. Here's my mass and here's my support on the left. And you shake the support to a variety of frequencies. Now, if you shake the support really slowly, the pendulum will just move with you, won't it? The support and the pendulum will move together. In other words, they're doing the same thing. And if you shake it really, really fast, you can shake the support with a high amplitude and the pendulum won't move much at all. Okay. Now in the middle, there's a, a magic frequency, whereas if you shake the support at the resonant frequency, the pendulum will move, move a lot more than support. It will be driven into oscillation. So we define a thing called the transfer function, which is the ratio of the motion of the pendulum to the motion of the support. And we can plot that transfer function in two different ways. We can look at the magnitude, which is the amplitude of the motion of the pendulum divided by the amplitude of the motion of support. And as a function of frequency, that amplitude looks like this. It's one at very low frequencies because the support just moves with the pendulum. Pendulum just moves with the support. At very high frequencies, it drops off to zero. And in the middle, you get this peak, a resonant peak, where the pendulum likes to move at a particular frequency dependent on its mechanical properties. Now, if you look at the phase, which is whether the signal, whether the motion of the pendulum is in phase with the support or out of phase with the support, and at low frequencies, it's in phase because the mass is just following the support. At high frequencies, it turns out it's out of phase. And at the resonant frequency, it goes through a transition between in phase and out of phase. So the phase shift at low frequencies is zero degrees, at high frequencies is 180 degrees, and exactly at the resonance is actually 90 degrees. So all linear circuits and filters have transfer functions, and you can manipulate those transfer functions to build the feedback controller to have the right properties you need to do your job that you're trying to do. So if we look at a feedback controller, we can look at it in terms of the frequency responses of different parts of the control circuit. So we've got some signal coming in. So this is quite abstract, just some signal coming in, which is a signal which has a frequency, which, which has an amplitude V in at frequency F. We take that signal and we put it into some instrument, say a gravitational wave interferometer. That instrument has its own frequency response, which I called HP of F, right? Now, at the output of that circuit, you then feed back through a feedback controller, which has its own frequency response, which usually you get to design, okay? So you can make this frequency response whatever you want. You take the output of that and you add it with a minus sign, so you actually subtract it from the input signal. So the pathway of the signal through this feedback loop can compensate for the appearance of the input signal. And the error signal is the sum of the input signal and this feedback signal. So that's the thing here, which you're trying to null out to zero. Now, this all sounds very nice, right? Because it sounds like it's a very generic way you can make an instrument behave the way you want it to. But because of this element of feedback, you also have to be very careful because if you design your feedback controller wrong, then it can, call, it can go into uncontrolled oscillation. So if you've ever played the electric guitar, if you put the guitar really close to the amplifier, you get a horrible noise, don't you? You get this whining, horrible feedback sound. And that is the feedback between the guitar and the amplifier being driven into oscillation. And if you're not careful, your um, in gravitational wave interferometer can do exactly the same thing. So you have to design your feedback controller quite carefully. Now, I don't have time today to describe how exactly to um, design a feedback controller. All I can do for those of you who are interested is refer you to a good book. So at the bottom of this slide, you'll see that there is a reference to a very good book on feedback controlled dynamic systems. And this 
diagram on the left is actually taken from the back cover of that book. And it's, it's a good book for students because it's designed for an undergraduate course. Now, in, in lieu of actually really going into the details on this topic, which I do not have time to do, um, I'm going to give you a very simple rule of thumb, which isn't foolproof, but most of the time it does the job. So what you do is you break the feedback loop and you put all the components in a row. So what are the components? There's the instrument, then there's the feedback controller, and then there's this sign change, this minus one, because when you sum the two together, there's a minus one on the feedback path, remember? So that goes in as well. And then you measure the frequency response of this thing in open loop. In other words, you drive the input at a range of frequencies and see what the output does. Now, here's the criterion which you can use to figure out whether when you connect this loop, it's going to lead to a stable controller. And it's a simple criterion. It says you find the frequency at which the, um, find the frequency at which the input and the output are exactly 180 degrees of phase out of phase with each other. There's going to be one magic frequency most of the time where that's true. Now, of course, there are more complicated examples where there are many frequencies where that's true. Then you have to go away and read this book. But lots of the time, there's just one frequency where you drive the open loop circuit at that frequency and the output turns out to be exactly out of phase with the input. And then you measure the gain, the magnitude of the gain of the open loop circuit at that frequency. And if that gain is less than one at that frequency, that means your feedback controller will probably not go into oscillation. It will probably be stable. It isn't guaranteed to work, but it works most of the time. So if you have an unstable feedback loop, one way to try and stabilize it is to turn the gain down a bit, because if you get below the gain, where the gain at this 180 degree frequency is one, then that will stabilize the loop. So this is a complicated topic. But I recommend you have a look at this book or some other book that describes feedback control if you're interested in this, because it's really an important thing for gravitational wave detectors. And it's an interesting subject in its own right, too. So why doesn't the feedback control system in LIGO actually suppress the gravitational wave signal? Well, that's actually kind of a, it's kind of a, a silly thing, but it turns out to be really important by well, I guess by luck more than anything, the seismic noise in the Earth's crust occurs mostly below a frequency of about 20 hertz, right? And the seismic noise that's at higher frequencies can be got rid of by seismic isolation systems that we can build. And so the combination of our seismic isolation systems and the fact that the seismic noise is dropping off anyway at high frequencies leads to the fact that most of the noise you have to control away is down at frequencies below about 20 hertz. By the time you get up to 100 hertz, which is where the signals we're trying to detect are, gravitational wave signals are actually, when they arrive, the dominant signal. If you servo away the noise, you have to servo away the signal as well. The machine doesn't know the difference between signal and noise. They're both just signals as far as the machine's concerned. But at frequencies like 100 hertz, it turns out that the gravitational wave signals are above the noise. And so we can detect something. And that's the sort of miracle of ground-based gravitational wave interferometry. It just turns out that you can build a sensitive machine on Earth sensitive to these relatively high-frequency gravitational waves. Other things are stabilized in LIGO as well. I've mentioned laser stabilization. So here's, again, master oscillator. You've got all of these amplifiers. There's one here, there's one here. And then the laser light has to make it through this high, high finesse pre mode cleaner cavity, which is trying to clean up the beam. Then it has to make it through another suspended mode cleaner, which it also has to be resonant with. All those resonances are maintained by a network of feedback control systems. And if you want to read about that, this reference at the bottom talks all about it. And you can see top left a picture of the laser table. It's a complicated beast because it's got all these amplifiers on it and all these control systems and the master oscillator and all the electronics to support it. So it's a complicated thing. But it works because of feedback control. Another side of this is lock acquisition. So if you're actually operating a gravitational wave detector, you will know that the machine starts out uncontrolled. And then you have to bring it into the controlled state. 
And that itself is a very complicated job. And there's a whole story behind the acquisition of Locke in LIGO. This paper, this optics letters paper, is the statement that LIGO actually achieved Locke with initial LIGO. And it's from 2002. So it's almost a, you know, it's an old paper, 18 year old paper now. But you'll notice that unlike most LIGO papers, there are very short author list on this paper. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 authors, including one Indian and one Pakistani. Right? So th th this shows you that this kind of job of stabilizing and running machines, actually in, in, in LIGO, it, it's surprising what small groups of people tend to work on, um, on, these, on these kinds of tasks, on getting the machine actually into the state where it can detect something. The, the analysis papers, there's hundreds of people working on analysis, but the instrument work tends to be the work of much smaller groups. All right, so I've got to the end. Um, so I'm gonna make a summary. So the first thing I'd say is that servo mechanisms and feedback controls are critical to the operation of gravitational wave interferometers. If you get a job working on a LIGO-like detector, you will spend most of your time locking servo mechanisms or redesigning them to work better. I've only had time for a very brief introduction to this subject. I tried to avoid most of the mathematics. You'll notice I skipped the page of mathematics because I realized I was going to run out of time. Um, I'm not apologizing for that because the best way to go over mathematics is usually on your own or in a small group. I don't think it's easy to learn these things in lectures anyway. I did put some references into my talk, and um, so if some of you could go look them up, and they are good books and papers, I recommend them. There are lots of topics I've completely missed. Um, feed forward is a sort of related technique, kind of similar to feedback. There's a thing called sensor correction, which is another technique. There are also many clever ways to design feedback control systems. There's a thing called the state space design method, which I haven't even mentioned. Also, the subtle... Um, art of converting analog signals, physical voltages on wires into digital signals and the implementation of feedback filters digitally rather than using a circuit with capacitors and resistors and inductors in it. Um, that's a whole other topic that you can spend a lot of time and a whole lifetime on, frankly. Uh, and finally, I'd just say that feedback control is, is a required skill for those who would build and operate LIGO India. Um, when you eventually have an optical configuration on a concrete slab in Hingoli. And if you're one of the lucky people who gets to be on site and be at the cutting edge of getting that machine into the locked state, then you will have had to learn all about the topics which um, I've talked about today and probably become way more expert on them than I am. And with that, I'd like to finish. Um, thank you very much. I'm hoping that the moderator is still around and is aware that I'm finishing. Um, and I think there might be some questions. So I'm going to stop sharing the talk at this point and go and look at the Google document that contains the questions. Okay. Let's see if I can find it. Okay, so I've got some questions um, and I'm just gonna go through and start answering them. The So can somebody just type in the chat that they can hear me just to make sure, because I just want to make sure that I'm still connected. Right, okay, good. So let me start going through the questions. Thanks to whoever did that. So I've got a question from Abhirishi here. And the question is, are nonlinear control cases encountered when controlling the electric parts at LIGO? And the answer is absolutely. Um, we, um, well, let, let, me, let me put it this way. You always want to make all the control problems linear um, because once you have a nonlinear control problem, it's much harder to understand any problems that you're encountering. If you think about um, a Michelson interferometer, where the output intensity is dependent on the difference between the arm lengths. If you keep one of the arms at a fixed length and you move the other arm's length, you move one, the mirror on the other arm outwards, what you see at the output of the machine 
is a sine wave in intensity. The intensity reaches a maximum, then it goes to a minimum again, then it reaches a maximum. So the output is for large enough displacements is a is highly nonlinear in the input. Okay, that that's that, and that's the norm. Almost all servos um, have nonlinear behavior in the plant that the servo is controlling. But if you can stabilize the positions of the mirrors so that you restrict the motion of the mirrors to within a small um, displacement from a fixed intensity using a control system, then the output will be linear with the input over that small range. And you try and operate the machine in that linear regime. Now, I think the question might be asking whether LIGO um, uses some more elaborate nonlinear control um, at all. Um, and I think the answer is that for the servos that are controlling the actual machine and the critical degrees of freedom of the machine, like the differential length and the alignment, we, everything is a linear controller. And you, 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 the controller's job is to keep everything linear, essentially. Um, there are, you know, in some sense, a bang-bang server, which I talked about at the beginning, is an example of a nonlinear control system. Um, we try to avoid using those because of the noise issues I, allu I alluded to. Um, but there will still be some switched mode drives in LIGO. Uh, the reason is that basically anytime you have a really high power driver, the sort of leading technology for, for, for applying high power is um, switched mode MOSFETs. And those are what's called class D devices. And they operate as switches. They don't have a useful linear regime. Um, you try to avoid those kinds of drivers anytime you can because they introduce noise. But I suspect that for some things such as, you know, pumps and motors, you can't avoid it. You're going to have some switched mode drivers present. You just try to have as few of them as you can. So the next question is from Diksha Dixit. Um, how is gravitational gradient noise prevented? Um, you know, I think... Let's see. I don't think you can actually prevent gravitational wave, gravitational gradient noise, and that is one of the problems with it. Um, you can't use a... I, the, the one way you can get rid of it is to build an underground detector. And so this is why the, um, the Einstein at home... Sorry, the Einstein um, telescope proposed... In, in, in Europe would be underground. It's so that the test masses are surrounded by um, rock and that's and surrounding the test masses in that way stabilizes the gravitational potential in their vicinity with respect to the gravitational potential you get at the surface of the earth. You get away with it in LIGO because the detectors um, at the sensitivity level at which they were designed, gravity gradient noise is not the leading noise source, okay? So, so your answer is you can't sort of prevent it. You can just put your detector somewhere where it's smaller, and that's what future higher sensitivity detectors will probably do. And so the next question is from Anupam Ghosh. What sorts of, what kinds of solutions are employed if the signal and noise fall in the same frequency range, unlike LIGO? Well, it's a great question. I mean, I, my view of it is that if the signal and the noise are at the same frequency um, and the signal is a transient, so it's only present for a very short amount of time, you really are stuffed. There is no solution in that scenario. You do have to have a signal that pokes up above the noise if you're going to detect it and it's a transient. Now, the other case is where the signal isn't a transient, where the signal is a continuous signal. So you might get signals like that, for example, from rotating neutron stars. If they have a non-axisymmetric um, mass, dis mass quadrupole distribution, if they're rotating and they've got a mountain on their equator, then they, then they emit a continuous stream of gravitational waves. And if you are if you then take the signal coming out of your detector, even if the gravitational wave is significantly smaller amplitude than the ambient noise background at that same frequency, 
if you average over a sufficiently long amount of time, you can discern the excess power at the frequency of the gravitational waves above the noise level of the background in adjacent frequencies. And that's possible because of a, well, there's an equation which comes in called the radiometer equation, which shows you that your, your signal to, the ratio of your signal size to the fluctuations in your noise between adjacent frequencies grows as the square root of the bandwidth and times the integration time. So there are some classes of signals in which you can detect sub-noise level signals, but only if those signals are con 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 continuous. If the signals are transients, you really do need them to be louder than a noise background. Okay, so that was a very good question. Um, next question, Abarishi, um, same, same person who asked question one. What response time in feedback loop is required for designing such large precise systems? Okay, so you're asking what LIGO's unity gain frequency is. Um, you know, it probably changes with time. I, it surely must be a few tens of hertz, but I don't actually know what it is now. They've redesigned all the servos since I used to work at the LIGO sites, and that's not a number which I'm familiar with, I'll be honest, but it's a few tens of hertz, I'm sure. And so basically the servos in LIGO don't have to be that fast, which is a good thing because until probably 10 years ago, you really couldn't digitally control anything with a linear servo and a frequency bandwidth above about 100 kilohertz. It's improved a lot recently, and that's because there's lots of new technologies being developed for very fast real-time digital systems having to do with things like mobile communications um, so there are new chips and new technologies like field programmable gate arrays, which allow you to have very fast servos. But the, the good thing is that because LIGO is mostly fighting seismic noise and because seismic isolation systems <coughs> work pretty well up down to frequencies of about 20 hertz, um, the sort of bandwidth, the, 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 the unity gain frequency bandwidth of our servos doesn't actually have to be higher than a few tens of hertz because above that frequency, we, we'd be servoing away the signal, and that wouldn't be a good thing. Okay, so those are all excellent questions. Um, are there any more? There are no more questions. Well, I've really enjoyed um, talking to you all. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to disperse science um, throughout the Indian community from, from my office. Um, and, and, and I've enjoyed giving the talk and they were good questions. So thank you all very much. And I shall, you know, if, if, if that's, we're at the top of the hour, right? So it's time to stop. So um, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>